Hello everyone, welcome to our masterclass today where we're talking about baking and biking. In other words, how to talk to parents about practice in a way that is inviting and fun and not at all preachy. My name is Nicola Canton. If we haven't met before, I am the person behind Vibrant Music Teaching and the Colourful Keys blog, and I'm joined today by the wonderful Samantha Coates. Thanks, Nicola. That's a lovely introduction. <laughs> We're going to be talking about practice today. So let's start by thinking about why we even need to talk about this. Why do we need to talk to parents about practice? What do you think, Sam? Well, parents are crucial. If we don't have the parents on side, it, there's not a lot of practice that's going to take place because the parents are in charge of the child's routine, mostly. So, and if the, and if having the parent on board, it's a process. Practice is a, practice is a process. We have one lesson per week. And if that lesson is half an hour, then we have 167.5 other hours in the week that the parent is in charge of. So we have to have them on site and yeah. um, it makes the whole process much easier if we do. Yeah, I mean, I would go so far as to say it's pretty much impossible for most students under the age of 10 if we don't have the parents' involvement. And I'm assuming you did that maths just on the spot right there, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have used, I will confess, I've used the line, you know, there's only 168 hours in the week. I've, I've, I've known that for a while. And so I've gotten very good at doing the maths if they've got a 30 minute lesson or a 45 minute lesson or a one hour lesson of how many hours are left. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So when we think about talking to parents about practice, we might be tempted to just tell them to get on with it, I think. Like we know that we need to talk to them about it, but really we feel like that's the parent's job. Like it's part of parenting, maybe some of us feel. Let us know in the chat if you feel like that. And that they should just get to it. You know, they should find a way to make it work for their child. One of the reasons I don't think that that's a be the best approach is because it's not equal. So the parents who know something about music, studied music themselves, or have some idea of how it works, are going to get on the practice train that way. And the parents who don't have experience, the families who haven't had music in their homes, probably aren't. Do you think that's the case? I think there's good and bad in both of those scenarios, actually, because the parents that I've had who are musicians, who know a lot about music, sometimes it's an uphill battle because they the, then the child is between two music teacher disciplines because the parent is also trying to teach the child um, and in some cases changing what we're trying to do or um, putting forward the thing the way that they learned when they were young which is not necessarily the way we want to teach. So um, there can be sometimes too much involvement from parents who are musicians, but yes, generally those kids are gonna have a head start. Then there are the parents who know nothing, but um, they, I think it's a matter of educating the parents that you don't have to be musical to be able to help your child. And a lot of parents take root, they remove themselves from the picture because they assume, well, I know nothing about music, so I can't help. And we have to educate them that that is, that is not the case. So it, it's true that it's not equal, but um, I think it, it absolutely can be equal. There's no, there's no question that um, um, it's possible for a child to be extremely musical and progress beautifully when they've been born to unmusical parents. Like that, it, it's, it's, it's absolutely possible. We just need the parent to be present and to be encouraging. Yes, absolutely. And they need to feel empowered, I think, to do so um, and not left out of the conversation because they feel like they don't have the secret language. So that's one of the many reasons why we wanted to talk about this topic today. Let us know in the chat whether you talk to parents about practice currently, different methods that you use to do that. Just to give you a sense of what we're doing today, we're going to be going through two different analogies, starting with baking and the, biking and then going to baking. Easy to mix those two up. So we're going to be going through the two of those and our different ways of talking about practice, as well as answering your questions as we go through. So without further ado, let's dive into our first analogy. Tell us about biking, Sam, and what it has to do with practice. Okay, so... 
biking, right? Learning to ride a bike. Um, quite a few years ago, I wrote a blog called Why Piano Playing is Like Bike Riding. And I went through all the different parts of, of how this analogy can work to help to get the point across to parents of their crucial role in practice. Because most parents have taught their children how to ride a, ride a two-wheeler bike. And they understand that they the process of teaching their child how to do that. And they also understand that sometimes their children are reluctant, that they fall off, that they need encouragement, because the parent understands that ultimately bike riding is a pleasant experience once you know how to do it. You just got to get there. So I'll just share my screen for a moment. Um, what I would like to do is just show, just go through the points, the points that I'm going to um, talk about with bike riding versus piano playing. So the first one is that we're going to talk about learning the skill. So the parent's role in teaching the child this skill of bike riding and how that relates to piano playing. Then we're going to talk about opportunities for practice because this needs to be created in both of those scenarios has the power. Then we'll talk about what makes progress, what, what equals progress, and we'll talk about what it means to get expert help. So for bike riding, it would be the mechanic who fixes the bike and for, uh, in piano, it's the lessons. Then I will talk about what happens with training wheels. We're going to extend this analogy very far. What happens when the training wheels comes off? We'll talk about coasting. And finally, talking about getting the right equipment. So I'm going to go through all of those and I'm very happy for this to be very, very uh, interactive. Um, so now um, we'll um, start off with learning the skill, the, par the parent's role in learning the skill. So uh, I was, I'd love to know in the chat how many of you have taught your kids how to ride a bike. Uh, or taught a family member how to ride a bike, I would submit that there are not many children who are able to teach themselves how to ride a two-wheeler bike. So it is, it is incredibly important that the parental role here is essential. So what happens when the child is learning to ride a bike is the parents are very encouraging and um, generally running along behind the child and holding, holding their seat, saying, come on, you can do it, helping them get their balance. And there's quite a few goes of doing this. And um, then, then and you know, in the process of riding a bike, there's a few little, probably little accidents, hopefully no crashes. But after a while, even though there might be quite a few times where the bike falls over, as long as the parent says, come on, you can do it, and keeps providing encouragement and opportunities, eventually the child gets it. The parent perseveres because they know that it's going to be really fun for the child once they get it. There aren't really any parents who would see that their child, you know, falls over and says, I don't want to do this anymore. And the parent then says, well, well clearly you don't like bike riding. So let's stop. Um, why don't do that? Because they understand that this is a process to get through. So that process it may take weeks or I, I can see that Sarah says uh, it took months. Um, it doesn't matter how how long that process of bike riding takes, but it usually is in weeks or months. But in piano, if we relate that to the support needed from parents in piano, that's that's a period of years, usually. So if a child starts at a young age, they need help and support with their practice. They need someone to understand what it is they're trying to do and to have somebody hit, uh, sit with them and kind of like you would hold on to their seat when they're bike riding, not expect them to just go and do it by themselves. And if they are struggling and if they are saying, I can't do it, I don't want to do it, that the parents shouldn't throw their hands in the air and say, well, clearly you don't like piano you, um, or they don't want to practice. It doesn't, um, don't mistake a child. I'm going to say this lots of times tonight. <laughs> don't mistake a child who doesn't want to practice for a child who doesn't want to play the piano because plenty of times they, they don't want to practice. So they um, eventually children learn to ride a bike with the right encouragement. Now, they also need opportunities to ride their bike. So if they have a very hilly, grassy backyard, or perhaps no backyard, then then they can't really, 
they can't really practice their bike riding. So parents will often create an opportunity to practice by taking them to a bike track and putting putting the bike in the car and driving to a place where they know there's a nice big flat track and, and a, a, great, a great place to practice and to get the hang of it. Um, so in, that's for bike riding. Now for piano, parents really need to create opportunities for practicing piano. It needs to be part of the routine. It needs to be built into the routine. It's not going to work if we just say, oh, well, we'll just, we'll just fit it in here and there. It never gets fitted in here and there. On Mondays, they've got gymnastics. On Tuesdays, swimming. On Wednesdays, ballet. On Thursdays, karate. On Fridays, maybe maybe they've got nothing on Friday. Amazing. Um, and then they have a play not... date. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. All the kids are just so overscheduled all over the world. And, um, and so if the practice is not timetabled in, then there's not really going to be and any opportunity for practice and therefore there won't be any progress. Just like if there was no chances given to actually practice riding a two-wheeler bike, they're not gonna get very good at it. They're not gonna learn how to do it. And eventually they're probably just going to feel negative about that activity because they haven't had a chance to actually practice. So it's really important for parents to create the opportunity. Then pulling this analogy even further, the actual riding, imagine that the pedaling and the steering is like progress. So um, if, if children don't pedal, they won't go anywhere. So the pedaling is like the practice time. They actually have to do it for a certain amount of time. And um, pedaling is the only way to really, really get going. If they don't pedal, they're going to fall over. Uh, so actually doing the practice is the only way to progress and doing it frequently is the only way where they're going to get to a point where they can do it. So when parents say, oh, we're going to do it, we're going to learn piano just for fun, sometimes that is the parent's way of saying, we're, we're not actually going to practice, we're just doing it for fun. Like they don't, they feel that they don't, yeah. they're not truly going to commit to it. And what I say to parents is, it's not going to be any fun at all if you don't practice. You can't get into the fun zone because you can't have fun with something that you can't actually do. So with bike riding, you would have to persevere until you could actually get your balance and steer and pedal well enough and do the activity in order to be able to have fun and go and go riding with your friends by yourself. Well, um, that's, that's a process that parents need to help children work through with practice as well. So um, the, the next thing that I was gonna talk about is um, when to call in the experts. Now, if, if students are not pedaling, if students are not progressing, then there's very little for the student, for the teacher to do. So each lesson has a sense of inertia about it because um, imagine that the teacher is the bike mechanic. If the bike is not being used, then there's nothing much the mechanic can do. Um, we do, can do a little tweak here and there, but um, it's, it's gonna be much more fun when there's practice going on during the week. And the, the practice is what enables good, thing, good stuff to happen in the lessons, not the other way around. Um, I mean, the lessons are great, but the lessons are often, what we do in the lesson is, should, should actually be a result of what's done in the practice the week before, not that the lesson is setting up the practice to come. I mean, it's kind of a, com a combination of both. I'd be yeah. interested to hear your thoughts on that, Nicola. Um, but it, uh, you can have you have a much better lesson if there's been some practice, and you can't you cannot learn piano in half an hour a week or forty five minutes a week or even one hour a week. No. It is not an isolated activity. There has to be something that happens in between. And another analogy is a sporting analogy. So um, I recently, like literally three days ago, ran my first half yes, marathon. Yes, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But the training for that started in May. And I said to my running coach, who happened to be Paul Myatt, that I wanted to do it. And he said, okay, well, you've got to do this, this, and this training, and you've got to do this many runs a week, and you've got to do that many kilometers. Now, so, but if every time we met up for a training session, I said to him, oh, I haven't had a chance to run this week. I just haven't had a chance. Then we wouldn't be able to do much in the training session, and I would not progress 
with my running. And so it's all very well to say, if you say you want to run a half marathon, that's great, but you have to do that training. Otherwise you, you can't ever, you can't ever get to the point where you can do it. And it's very much, I mean, piano practice and piano playing is very much like fitness. It has to be something that's done very frequently and, um, and consistently in order to get the progress. And if you stop doing it, you, you get unfit and you do forget. And the thing about bike riding is they say that you never forget how to ride a bike. Um, and that's probably true. Once you get the sense of the balance, you might be wobbly if you haven't done it for 20 years, but you can yeah. still do it. However, you can absolutely forget how to play the piano. You can, you can get completely out of practice. If you don't touch it, those skills do fade. They fade, fade, fade. And it's a great shame, um, but that's what happens. So um, it's very important for parents to understand that the frequency of the practice is so important and the encouragement during the practice is so important because that's what gives us the progress. So um, now, if it, to, to take this analogy one step further, a note about the, um, if, we, if we're on training wheels and about coasting. So um, imagine, you know, when, when, when kids have training wheels, that's a bit like the parent doesn't have to do much with the bike riding. It's kind of like having nappies or having diapers. It's like, okay, we're safe for now. But when the training wheels come off, that is when we really need the support and encouragement. So think of training wheels as those the very first, the honeymoon period when a child is learning piano. So maybe there's a huge steep learning curve at the beginning and they're very excited and they seem to be going to the piano all the time and practicing all the time. That's lovely. But then there'll come a time where they really need to do some, some hard work and then maybe they'll decide, oh no, this is too hard. So the training wheels have come off and now they're saying, oh no, I don't like it anymore. And it would be very easy for the parent to throw their hands up and say, oh, we thought he liked piano, but it turns out he doesn't. No, that's when they need more encouragement and more support to get through that. And there'll be such a sense of achievement from the child when they work through and they're actually able to do that. Um, so, um, coasting on a bike is when you've done lots of pedaling and lots of practice. Um, when you do pedaling and you work really hard to get to the top of a hill, you can coast for a while. And that, that is fine. You don't have to pedal. And so if you've worked really hard for a period of time on piano and you've, let's say you've learned your four pieces for your exam, that's great. Then you can, co you might coast for a while. You don't need to do much hard work, but after a while, it's not going to work. The coasting is, the, the practice routine has to come back. And the final thing about this bike analogy that I want to say is that the equipment is so important. So parents know that if their child is riding a bike that is rusty and has flat tires and gears that don't work, then it makes it very difficult for the child to have a positive bike riding experience. They won't be able to keep up with their friends going up a hill or with the rest of the family going around a track or it just, if it's a bike that doesn't work properly, how can they, how can they have a good time? But parents don't, if the child says, I don't want to go bike riding because their bike doesn't work. The parent will often say, oh, well, we need, we need to get Johnny a new bike. So they'll maybe do that for their next birthday or something like that. The parent doesn't usually say, oh, well, clearly he doesn't like bike riding. Oh, well, and then, and then just not, and just not go bike riding because little Johnny doesn't want to ride the rusty bike. And it's very similar with piano. So if there is a little tiny weenie four octave toy um, piano that the child has used just for the very beginning of piano lessons, it's fine maybe for, for that, those first couple of weeks of orientation, but they're going to need, uh, they're going to need a decent instrument in order to be able to play. And, um, and upgrading the instrument as they progress can be quite important. Sometimes students will hit a point where they, they lose motivation to practice. And it really is because of the limitations of the instrument and it's really important for us to have communication with the parents to, to explain that upgrading the instrument is going to increase the motivation to practice, just like getting a decent bike would increase the motivation to bike, go bike riding. But the most common reaction that we get from parents is, but they're not practicing. Why am I going to invest in a piano if he's not even practicing? 
But the thing is, the reason he's not practicing is because there's not a decent instrument. And it's, it's, we have to encourage the parents to have the confidence to invest and that there will be a absolutely renewed enthusiasm that comes from that child when, when the instrument is upgraded. Um, yes, I can see some of the, the uh, light, nightmare stories coming in, like keyboard on a table and low yeah. chairs and um, a, a bad setups. So um, one thing that I think has revolutionised uh, the piano teaching world since we've all had to do online teaching at some stage in the last 18 months is that we now see the, the kids set ups at home and we didn't really used to see it that much before. We didn't really have intimate knowledge of exactly what instrument and what their posture was like. And so I know I've been on a mission to be fixing that um, and I sometimes been horrified in that first mm -hmm. time my lesson. You're playing where? You're playing on what? Um, you're sitting that high? So um, it's, it's all about, I, I think the bike riding analogy works because um, most parents have experienced it. Yeah. And so from the point of view of the support and the actual riding and the equipment necessary, it can be a really good one. So feel free to, um, if you um, have forgotten everything that I just said, there's, there's a blog called Why Piano Playing is Like Bike Riding and you can refer parents to it. And I've had a lot of parents say that they found it very helpful. Yeah, refer to parents to it and actually talk it through as well. I think that's really important because they might not necessarily read it. It's, I almost find it's better for them to read it as a reinforcement of what you've already said and back and forth um, and actually start a conversation with them. It's such a good point about equipment as well because um, it's so obvious to parents that they couldn't ride a rusty bike. But if they don't know about pianos, it seems like that's a beginner keyboard and then the other one is for more advanced students, but that's just not how it works. Mm. So it's great to say it to them up front and keep following up on it. One tip, since you mentioned the online lessons and everything, um, something I have done for a long time is new students have to take a photo of themselves at the piano at home. It's like part of how they start lessons to check their yeah. posture at home. And so we've always gotten to see their home instruments because parents can often say, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a really good one. Or it, one of them even, it was given to us by a composer friend, so it must be good. But he clearly was <laughs> using it as a MIDI input, you know, so... <laughs> It wasn't good for what we need. It was great for him and his computer. Um, so, yeah, really, really important to check on that. And I love that whole analogy. I think it's fantastic. I love the quote that came from Rebecca there. I say it's good to have fun, but it's fun to be good. I think I'm going to oh, have yeah. to steal that, Rebecca. That's a great way to put it because I say similar things, but not that snappy. So that's good. I like it. Yeah. And Amber has said um, about the online lessons and seeing the setup that she's going to ensure students do an online lesson as part of their orientation mm -hmm. moving forward even when we're not in lockdown. So um, that that actually is a really great idea because it is fantastic to be able to set people up. Yes. Mm. Awesome. Well, we're going to switch over to baking mode. While we do that, Sam, do you have the link to the blog post? You could pop it in the chat. I absolutely can do that right now. Yeah. So my analogy is about baking and Sam and I both think these align so closely together, which is why we wanted to do this together. So this comes from my book, which is called Practice Pie. Um, and when I decided to write a book for parents, I decided to write it about pie for several reasons. Number one, because I wanted something a bit fun and silly. And number two, because I wanted something that works in layers and that parents really get that one thing must come before the other sometimes and that there's all these different elements that go into this great practice pie. So this is how I talk to parents about practice in the book and in general in my studio. We start with a pie dish. And this is something that I came to after probably many years of teaching was to decide that in the first semester, the only thing I care about is a habit. And I had to make that ruling with myself because I was so tempted to go to the next stage and the next stage with things. Like I want the practice to be great. I want them to be doing repetitions and trying different practice strategies. But I eventually resolved that if the practice habit doesn't get developed, that stuff is all completely useless. And even if they don't ever get to all that other stuff, 
if they at least have a habit of sitting down and playing things, even if it's not optimally, we can work on that and they can get somewhere. But if they're just not practicing, they're just not practicing. So what are we going to do? So that's why, to me, this is the pie dish, because it's the thing that you put everything else inside. If you don't have a pie dish, you can't make a pie. You're just going to put a bunch of flour and water and other things into an oven, and it's going to be a big, <laughs> giant mess all over the oven with apples everywhere. And we know how hard it is to clean ovens at the best of times, so let's avoid that. Yes, we need a pie dish to put everything in. So I talk about two different types of pie dishes with parents. Um, and these are different ways of establishing a routine that I found work. Um, the first way is to make it a specific time of day. Now, in the book, I go into this where that is great and it's simple and that's lovely. But for most families, it's not actually the best option. If there is a time of day where they are always home, at least on weekdays, let's say, they're always home together at 3 p.m., well, great. But as we just mentioned, most kids are not only doing piano and they also have siblings doing all sorts of things. So they're all over the place. They're not always home at 3 p.m. after school. They have badminton and dancing and taekwondo and whatever else they're doing. So that's why the second type of practice dish is the one I normally recommend to parents, which is to tie it to something else in your routine. Anything that happens every day. Um, I always float the suggestion of doing it by, before school because although as a kid this would not have worked for me, I mean, my mum would have laughed in the teacher's face if they said this. <laughs> because I had to be dragged out of bed in the morning and many kids are like that but some wake up before their parents and want to annoy the whole household so if that's <laughs> your kid maybe they can do it in the morning when everyone else is having breakfast because they've already had it by themselves yeah um so it depends on each family but normally food is a good thing to tie it to or homework if they get homework every day things like that something that always happens that you can tag this onto. This is just a foundational thing to do with habit building. It's not exclusive to piano practice. If you wanna develop a new habit, like Sam's running, maybe you build <laughs> it onto something else you're already doing in your day. So it happens after this thing or before that thing. So that is a pie dish. And once you have your pie dish, you're ready to start baking your pie. But like I say, this is all I do for the first semester with a new student until they've established their pie dish. I don't care how long they practice, what exactly they do during their practice. I say, aim to get through all the things on your assignment list. But if you don't, some days, that's fine. If your kid is having a bit of a wobble and they just sit down and play one note, that's fine. You've kept the habit. That's all we care about. So after that is established, that's when we can start to make it better. And this is where we need some pie ingredients and we start to build the pie crust. So we have our flour, first of all. And this is where we start to make sure the practice time is quality because we want our flour to be good quality. Most of a pie crust is basically flour. So whether it's almond flour or spelt or good old regular baking flour, it has to be good quality. And to me, that means that the parent for those younger kids especially, is actually sitting with them at the piano. Like it is literally quality time that they spend together. And I've heard from several parents that really do take this on. This becomes a lovely bonding time. It doesn't have to be this miserable experience where you're forcing your kid to sit there. It can be that this is the time they get to spend one-on-one -on -one with mom or with dad. And that's rare in a family with lots of siblings. So it can be a really lovely quality time experience. I encourage parents to put away their phone during this and really get absorbed in it. They don't have to know about music to do that. They just have to be engaged with their child and what is happening with them. And they can even ask their child to teach them things to further enhance the time. And we know if we get our students to teach someone else something, they learn a huge amount from that process. So what we're trying to do is make parents want to be there for the practice, to involve them. So we need them to know what's going on for that to happen. But once they have that mindset of this, I'm part of this process, at least for the first several years, yes, years, which might come as a shock to them, 
then um, they can spend that quality time and get that quality flower. And one of the things I talk about in this section is actually um, taking the flower and putting it into a container. You know those people who have a pantry in their kitchen that's like full of all these organized containers? You see them on Pinterest and they're, they've got like calligraphy on them and they're all beautiful. I'm not that person. <laughs> and I think probably most parents aren't that person. But with practice, with piano, I want them to be that careful with their flower. And by that I mean they take it home, they pour it into a container, meaning they take, they come home from the lessons and they actually ask their kid about what was done and check the assignments right away. One of the big things that I've seen in my studio is a difference between Friday students and Monday students. Have you, ever, have you ever noticed a difference, Sam? Friday students. I have to admit that um, I don't teach on Fridays. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yes, um, but I know many colleagues who have said that Friday afternoons are really tough. They're, They're really, really tough, tough on the lessons. And the toughest part of it to me, what I've noticed is they go home and the weekend is their off time for practice, yes. which is, you know, fine under normal circumstances. If they're going to practice five days a week and not the weekends, that's okay. But if you have a lesson on Friday, by the time you get to Monday, they've forgotten everything. <laughs> so mm. coming home and putting that flower into a container, meaning talking about what actually happened in the lesson and all the assignments is really important. The next ingredient after the flour is the water. And this is one of the main reasons why I wanted to write this book, actually, was because of the difference between families that listen to music and those that don't. You might be shocked mm. as, a, as a musician or someone who comes from a musical family yourself to hear how silent some homes are. And that's, of course, that's everybody's preference. But without music in the environment and without talking about music together, as some families naturally do, you haven't got that water that glues everything together. You haven't got things to make things sticky. And so without all those different influences of music, you can tell me in the chat if you've had any students who you've noticed this with. I mean, the most obvious thing that often results from it is they just can't keep a beat beyond a certain age even, they're not keeping a beat and it's not because of any kind of dyspraxia or any other underlying condition. It's just that they haven't listened to a lot of music and like danced around their home with, with their folks mm. as I would have. Mm. I mean, I was dancing around to the Beatles all day. That's all I did. So um, getting that water into the flower base, I think is really important and getting families listening to music and giving them suggestions about what to listen to to make music sticky in their lives and make them into lifelong musicians. And then after that, we need to make it a little bit tasty because right now we've got flour and water in a pie dish. It's not looking very appetizing. So every good pie crust is gonna need some kind of oil or butter to make it glisten and make it a bit more flavorful. And this is where the kind words from parents really come in. So these are the growth mindset compliments. If you can talk to your parents about that, about, um, I don't like to say the right type of compliments, but about compliments that are more helpful or the ways that we talk to them. So focusing less on talent or even good job and more on, I can see you the work that you put in makes a huge difference. And they don't have to get this right every time or on the first try. It's totally a, an ongoing process, but it's definitely something we can educate them about as well is how do we give these compliments that really help our, our kids to keep going, not just make them feel good in the moment. And that's where the growth mindset, I think, is really beneficial for that. So that is the butter that makes it all a lot smoother. So it's starting to look good, but we've got one crucial mm -hmm. ingredient left in our pie crust and that is the salt has anyone ever baked anything pie cake whatever and you forgot the pinch of salt that's always in the recipe it does not go well <laughs> yeah. 
It's one of those things where you think, well, I don't need additional salt in my diet. I mean, I, it seems it's such a tiny amount. What's it going to do anyway? But you forget the salt one time and you discover, well, that did not work. So <laughs> the salt in piano to me is the goals and they have to be the right size. They have to be small enough, just a pinch of them that it doesn't become overwhelming. It's not about constantly pushing for the next exam or the big recital all the time. It's often about smaller goals week to week that a kid can understand that are simple, but that they know what they're working towards. We know our best practice is when we sit down and we know what we're trying to do, right? And that might be just instinctive to you, right? You don't sit down with a piece and go, well, I'll just play and see what happens. Most of the time we have something we want to achieve. So kids need to develop this over time by giving themselves and their parents helping them with tiny little goals. I'm going to try and play this piece at a certain tempo or without any rhythm errors or while counting aloud, simple things that they can understand that just give that pinch of salt to the recipe that makes it all come together and taste the way you want it to taste. And then we're ready to put the crust in the oven. So this is where we get to repetitions. And this is something I may be shied away from. I don't know, anyone else can let me know if you were the same with this. But as a younger teacher, I didn't really talk about repeating things, as obvious as that might sound as something to talk about, because it felt so like doing times tables, like it feels like kind of stuffy and old fashioned somehow to talk to a kid about you must do it five times in a row or whatever. But without repetition, nothing gets done. And I have found some kids, they just don't get this message by themselves. They need to be taught that you have to repeat things over and over. You're not actually supposed to get it right on the first try. Many kids don't realize that. Many parents won't even realize that. It's not supposed to sound like the finished recording the first time you play it. Otherwise, what are you learning? I mean, why are you practicing it? There's no point. So when I talk about heat, that's about the repetition in small ways and in a block. And then eventually starting to talk to parents and students about interleaved practice, which mm. I refer to as the fan oven, right? It's what gives it that extra boost and makes it cook really evenly and really nicely. When we go from piece A to piece B, back to piece A, back to piece C, and then keep going like that, rather than doing everything in one big block. The reason I wait a while to talk about this, though, is it feels much harder. So in the moment, your brain is working so hard and it feels really tough. <laughs> and that can feel like I'm getting, I'm not getting as far, I'm not doing as well. But you actually are, you're getting further because your brain is working harder and that's actually what we want. Not, well, I was going to say not to mix analogies, but to mix analogies, <laughs> I should <laughs> say, since I'm in the middle of a pie. One thing, one thing I like to refer to here is it's like the difference between reading through your history book and thinking, oh yeah, I've heard that before. And you just read it through versus actually studying where you quiz yourself all the time and your brain is working really, really hard on what it is that you're reading. If you don't quiz yourself, you're just going to feel like, yeah, I kind of get it. And this is where we get the famous, I played it better at home comment, right? Where you're just <laughs> playing it through and it seems fine and everything's going well. So that interleave practice is sort of the next level, but I wouldn't get to, into that with parents right away for sure. And then after that, we get to put in fun fillings. So this is the fun part of the recipe. And I'd love to hear your favorite pies in the comments. <laughs> so mine has always been banoffee. And um, since I was a kid, I've always loved banoffee. And so this is also my favorite practice game. So I'll share this one with you and you let me know your favorite pie. There are six in my book. So there's lots for parents to play from with, but not um, so much that it gets really, really overwhelming for them. It's just six different recipes. The Madafi is where we get three objects. I didn't prepare three objects, but let's take three random things off my desk. Okay, so I've got three things, my phone and two pens. So one is going to be the banana, one is going to be the toffee, and one is the cream. The iPhone will be the cream, why not? So I put these over the left side of the piano, 
This is a very simple game. You may have, may have played it under other names, but it's so effective. So I play the thing with my goal in mind. So I play a short section and my goal is to play it at 80 beats per minute with the metronome, right? And if I do that correctly, woohoo, I get to move one of the objects, the banana, over to the right side of the piano. Now I play it again and I rush into it and I get it wrong. I make a mistake. So the banana is going back over here to the left side of the piano. And then I play it again and I get it right and it goes over and hopefully I get it right again and then hopefully I get it right again and the cream is on top of my banoffee. So it's just a way to get in repetitions and make sure that students always finish by playing it multiple times in a row correctly, not just once and saying, well, I got it now, right? Which means that mm, it's not always going to go smoothly the next time. So that is our basic pie recipe with lots of different fillings. I see lemon meringue in the comments from Sarah. I haven't had lemon meringue in so long, but my mum used to make that. I love that pie. What's your favorite pie, Sam? Um, I would say, oh, what's my favorite pie? Well, I don't really, I don't, I, I, don't, I would person. say my favorite, hey, can I'm not a pie person. Can I, can I change it to um, chocolate brownies? <laughs> I'll, I'll just we'll bake chocolate brownies instead. I, mm -hmm. I don't mind apple pie, but I prefer the pastry to the actual apple. So I just like pastry and ice cream. That's, that's me. <laughs> but, um, that should be a I new pie. pie. We should make one. <laughs> Sorry? We should invent yes, a I pie should. that's just a pie crust and then you just pour ice cream into it. Sounds yeah. great. <laughs> that's right. But I do love the idea of saying that there's these ingredients that stu students are trying to make a pie by getting the ingredients to go across in that cross the river type of game um, because it also just reinforces the point that you when you are doing repetitions the repetitions need to be correct so often um, uh, I mean this is a classic demonstration that I do on my workshops this is a typical child going to practice so they'll go to play for at least And they made a mistake and then they just start again. Oh, and they've tried again. They've done the same mistake again. And then the third time, they'll do it again. And they're getting yeah. more and more frustrated. They might be going, ah, I'm bashing the piano. Um, and then, and what's happening is they're inadvertently practicing in the error. Yeah. They're actually getting very good at playing it incorrectly. And then maybe after four or five times, they do it again. work either because now they've done it four times wrong and one time right so they've actually done it more times wrong than right so with the and that that so the next time they come to play it they're far more likely to play it incorrectly because that's what they practiced yeah so um, the repetition um is important but it needs to be quality and correct repetition so um but that that whole thing of putting the ingredients across the keyboard um, and you're actually trying to bake something is brilliant because if you do get it wrong, that ingredient goes back again. And so there's an understanding that it does need to be correct in a row to get all the objects across. Exactly. And I find Very that that you're just talking about there. Some of my adult students are the absolute worst for that and they get the most frustrated because they play it wrong until they get it right. And then they think they have fixed it like, well, I've got the screw in the right place now, it's done. And practice this doesn't work like that. So with adults, yeah, you can try these games with them. Like I just, I do all the same types of things with my adults and they just play along with it. But you can also talk to them about averages because they understand the average of all the times you have ever played this is incorrect. <laughs> That's, yes. that's what's happening here. Yes. Your brain doesn't go, oh, well, the last time was this. So I'll store that one and throw all the others in the bin. Our brains are not yes. that convenient. So yeah, definitely yes. something to talk to them about. Yes. And I think it's important for students and parents to understand that um, I often say, you know, your, your brain doesn't have ears. Like your ears know that it's wrong, but um, you have given your brain information by putting your fingers in a certain combination and your brain doesn't understand your ears have sensed, oh, if that was wrong, I need to do it again. But actually the physical coordination information that you've given to your brain is that's what your brain, what your brain is going to remember. And you have to retrain you, that you have to change that information. 
Um, so it's all very well to recognize orally that you've made a mistake, but something has to change physically in order to fix that error. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's not only pitch errors, there are all kinds of other errors. Yeah. So, you know, we could do a whole other webinar on how to fix mistakes. But that that's but the point is that, um, that yes, repetition in the interleaving is is so important. Um, and by interleaving, you know, like that you're saying swapping, swapping um, yeah. the activities that you're practicing. And the way I've heard that described, there's a wonderful, wonderful book called Make It Stick, um, yeah, which is. Yeah, it's brilliant in, in, in describing how we learn. And what it says is that the reason why it's so important to keep changing activity you're doing is because when you do repetitions over and over and over, you get a false sense of mastery mm. um, because it's easy to do it correctly if you've just done it correctly a split second before. What's going to be difficult is to do it correctly once you've left it for a while. And so in order, and then when you're trying to get it back again, when your brain is thinking, oh, what was this again? I've got to get my head around it again, whether it's coming back to a, math, a maths problem, um, or anything, that's where you're doing the most learning when your brain is doing, we've got that feeling of, oh, getting your head around it again. So in order to do really good learning, your brain has to have a chance to forget. And that's what the interleaved practice does. So it gives you, you have to have a break from that little passage that you're doing or that piece so that you can have a tiny, weeny bit of forgetting and then you come back and you do the relearning and that's where the real progress is made. And that's what happens overnight. Your brain automatically forgets a little bit when you come back the next day um, and you practice something so much the previous day and it's gone, especially if it was Bach, um, that's, that's normal. And you've got to get that back. But the, the retrieval, it's, it's called, they talk about effortful retrieval mm. in that book. And that's where, when you're doing something over and over and over again, it's not effortful retrieval. You're just, you're just doing it. It becomes automatic and you've got to be able to do it without it being automatic. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there were some questions there about the author. That's by Chip and Dan Heath, two brothers. I mean, I, haven't I got that right, Sam? The make it stick one, I yeah. think. Is that by Professor Somebody. I'll have to look oh, that sorry, up. Oh, sorry. Maybe I've got the wrong. I've mixed it up with another book then. Make it stick. I've oh, read a few I'm books on the same up. vein. <laughs> and it's called The Science of Successful Learning. It's by Peter C. Brown here. I'll, oh, there I'll you go. Back. Yeah. So that's in the chat. Angela yeah. wrote that. Peter C. Brown. Um, okay, so yeah. we're happy to take more questions from all of you to make these analogies come to life for you, to help you talk about these with parents or to talk about practice generally with parents um, on anything. We also wanted to briefly mention, Sam, about overworking the dough, as I call it, or the idea of parents that are too involved. So how do you deal with parents who are stepping over the line and becoming too involved in their child's practice, being controlling, perhaps being negative? How do you deal with that? I had an experience with this very thing recently. Now, um, this was a situation where um, the mother was kept on being very helpful and jumping in uh, all the time, every time um, uh, poor little Herb, um, his name's Herbie, so cute. Um, he was actually named after Herbie, Herbie Hancock. Oh, wow. and, and the mother was always being very helpful. So if Herbie was, had his hands in the wrong place and I could tell his hands are in the wrong place with it, and I was waiting for him to start so he could hear the wrong sound, but his mother jumped in and quickly moved his hands to the right place. And, um, and then the, she would always be doing these. She was thinking that she was helping. Um, and you know, if he, if he paused for a bit, she would point to the music, she would help him. She would, she wanted it to be a good performance, what he was playing in the lesson. So, um, and, I, I ended up ringing her and exp I said, look, first of all, thank you for all your support. You want to say thank you. It's wonderful that Herbie has this much support. I really, really think it's just fantastic. Um, I just wanted to let you know, though, that if I don't say anything, if I'm, if I'm not saying anything about the fact that Herbie's hands are in the wrong spot or the fact that he's made a mistake, it's not that I haven't noticed. I've absolutely noticed. But there's there'll be a, some sort of reason and it's different every time of why I'm not saying that it's because it's going to lead to a teaching moment mm. I I need to see him make that error 
and then we're going to discuss how that happened. And if you jump in and correct him, it actually removes the opportunity for me to have that teaching moment. Um, anyway, she, she took that on board very positively and I guess from a parent, what they want to, all they want to, they, they want their child to learn. They absolutely want their child to learn. So they would not want to think that they were impeding the learning. So rather than me asking the mother, oh, look, can you just stop doing that? Um, then it was, it was a matter of me saying, I, I, am, I am purposely not saying anything mm. because um, we are, you know, that's, cause that's how I teach really. Um, and also there might not be, it may not be that, um, I mean, there are so many things other than pitch that I'm listening for. So yeah. just because there's a pitch error, the, the rhythm, fluency, dynamics, articulation might have been beautiful. And I'm not concerned that there was a pitch error. So even when the parents are jumping in saying, oh, no, 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 that was wrong. Um, so, but that's a mild, that is a description of a, only a very mild thing that that parent was doing. When you've got a parent who's really thwarting your teaching philosophy, that is really tricky and you need to have open communication and ask the parent what their expectations are for their child and some, and get them to trust you that you can fulfill that for them. But it's very, very important to have, um, for the child to have a, a well-defined view of who is their teacher and, um, and to go with one teaching philosophy only. And it may well clash with how the, how the parent learned but um, none of us do things the same way that we were taught. None of us parent the way we were parented and um, very few of us teach the way we were taught because we find new and exciting things and more convincing ways to do it. So um, I've never actually used a phrase with a parent saying, oh no, now we don't parent the way we were parented because I think that would open up a huge can of worms. Yeah. But um, <laughs> That uh, would have you stuck at the door on their way out for... <laughs> an hour i think <laughs> yes um so what do you do nicola when a parent is over, overstepping the line yeah so similarly i will point out that um why i'm doing what i'm doing just so that they know that i have put thought into it and it's not just random i'm not missing anything just to get that out of the way i also like to be aware of the fact that sometimes and this may not be the case for that parent but sometimes what they're really doing is trying to prove that they did do the practice because when the student doesn't do it the way they did at home the parent almost feels defensive about it and that's almost a good sign because it shows that they do think it's their responsibility for the practice to happen at home but they need to know that we understand that it won't look exactly how it did in practice and that we still know practice is happening and they also need to understand that every kid goes up and down and backwards and forwards and we're used to seeing that and it doesn't mean their child is different or anything like that. So sometimes it's out of an insecurity of some type like that. So I try to get it back to the source of why is the parent doing this? Do they think it's helpful? Are they um, fighting at something going on in their own head? Or are they? is it some residue of their own lessons growing up? Because sometimes that's what's happening. It's a little bit of a yeah, something left over from the way they learned, be it in a good way or a bad way. And um, they're trying, that's just coming out in the way that they participate in the lesson. So I try to let them know the best thing for them to do during the lesson. And if they're still, this has never happened, but if they were still interrupting or anything like that, I would give them another job to do. So what would be really helpful is if you took notes <laughs> in an, your own notebook you know, um, during the lesson so that you can discuss all of this or you can follow it up at home um, just to take them out if they're really chatty. But I haven't ever had to go that far. I've usually just had a little chat and it's changed things or sometimes suggested that they don't sit in on the lesson um, if that's going to be better for their kid. And if that's the case, I don't tell them it's anything to do with them. I say every kid is different and some really like their independence in their lesson and this is their time to do their own thing. It's their one-on-one -on -one session and some kids just um, respond better in that environment. So I would bring it back to yeah. what their kid needs. Yeah. In fact, Beth has just asked, 
you know, do you encourage parents to sit in and listen or not? So I think there's there's three issues here. So there's the one that you just mentioned, Nicola, of after a while, you're going to get more results with the parent not there. And the, sometimes you the rapport completely changes between you and the student, parent not there. Um, and that's uh, something I found um, in the past 12 months because I always used to encourage parents to sit in the lesson um, and up until you know if I felt that in if I felt that it really was impeding my rapport with the student I would say okay maybe we'll try without but 99% of the time parents would sit in then because of COVID they weren't allowed to we were still doing in-person teaching but it was just safer if we didn't have you know if the parents didn't come and now I really enjoy teaching without the parents there because I do have that slightly different rapport. But it does require more curiosity from the parent to find out what happened in the lesson, more communication from me. And um, they, they can't necessarily see exactly what's happening in the lesson because they're not there. Um, and then there are some parents who sit in but don't do anything. They're just on their phone. So mm. they may as well be there. Then, then there's absolute, the parent should only sit in if there's a value add. If the parent is paying attention, taking notes and asking questions, or maybe not asking questions, but at least clearly taking notice, then they are that's a value add. If the parent is just sitting there because they've got nothing else to do and they're on their phones, not only is, does that not add value, that is distract, detracting because that is then affecting the rapport that you could be having with the student with just the, you and just the student, uh, which is very different. Um, and it's worth trying, it's worth saying to the parent, look how about we just try with just us next week and see how it goes. Yeah. Um, there are definitely pros so, and cons in both directions. On balance for my studio, I, I prefer no parents in the room. But that it, it is a personal decision. And it does mean you need to be very aware of the communication you do outside with parents to make sure that they're involved still in lessons. The only time parents really sit in is the first few lessons with a student who's shy and doesn't want their mum to go. And then, of course, they're welcome to stay. Right. But mm, yes. it's it's really up to the kid just being comfortable staying there. Um, I have had parents sit in before and it's they're not always going to be in the way or anything like that. But I do find the relationship is so different when they're not there that usually it's better without them. Um, it does depend on every kid. I wanted to address something that came up earlier there, which I don't know if you've ever done, but um, someone brought up the idea of doing a parent like induction or meeting at the start of the year, which is a blog post that I had before and they had tried it and a few people in the chat there had tried it, which is wonderful and went really mm. well. And I do think that's a great thing to do as I mean obviously because I do it in my own studio and it's also a great place to address things like was brought up there about parents writing in letter names on the score or teaching their kids mnemonics at home or those kinds of things I really like a parent group as an environment to address that because it doesn't feel like I'm singling that parent out so if I have to have that conversation with a parent I will but normally I can head that off at the pass if I have the group of parents together and I explain generally about practice and all those things but also our general teaching philosophies and how we do things and so mnemonics and reading and you know how I learn versus how I teach now comes up during that and uh, several parents in the room go and they're the ones that have been teaching their kid mnemonics at home and they didn't know it was a bad thing but this is all it takes for them to twig like oh maybe I shouldn't do that anymore <laughs> or to follow up with me later and it's not as it doesn't feel directed at them or like they did something wrong in that environment so I find that useful have you got any tricks for correcting parents with behaviors like that oh well the whole mnemonic thing is you know yes that is parent the ultimate in parents thinking they're being helpful and it is the most unhelpful thing on the face of the earth um, so yes, to, and if you don't, it sometimes, I mean, most of the time I just assume that that would never happen. And that's silly of me because, um, parents will always jump in and do that. But, um, um, I think that I just, I, I have always wanted to every, well, last year I wanted to do this and I didn't get an opportunity to do it. But if you're inviting all the parents over, you could say it's going to be, um, Pino and practice. 
So you're going to offer them a glass of Pinot mm. and we're going to chat about practice or Pinot posture and practice or something like that. It's just going to be an orientation night for parents. Um, and it'd be wonderful if they actually turned up. That would be great. Uh, but so, um, but I mean, it's, it's such a negative thing though to say, now this is what I don't want you to do with your child because um, we just want them to be very supportive. Um, but I think one thing that I, I think Rebecca, I think it was Rebecca that said she gets a couple of star parents to stand up and quickly talk about what works for them at yeah. home, what, how they get their kids to practice. I think that's an absolutely brilliant idea. Um, and also to let parents know that, find out what their expectation of normal is, because a lot of parents think that if their child likes piano, that they will automatically gravitate towards the instrument and practice on their own. That is not normal. It might happen in a very small percentage of yeah. cases. But once again, do not mistake a child who doesn't want to practice for a child who doesn't want to play the piano because they do want to have this skill, but the practice is tough and, yeah. and it needs what an encouragement. Um, and um, the other thing I think it's really important for parents to know is that practice doesn't sound good. If it is sounding good, yeah. they're not practicing. They're just playing. And um, if when, when we're trying to practice something, we are doing little passages with lots of repetition, sometimes very slowly. And, um, you know, and I say to my students now, you're going to do this so slowly at home that your mum and dad are going to be in the other room going, why is she playing so slowly? This is driving me mad. Or if your parents are saying, do you have to do that again? And why are you playing that bit over and over? Mm. If you're frustrated with your parents, you're practicing well. It's certainly a good thing to say to teenagers. Um, so, or siblings. Um, it's like even more <laughs> joy in frustrating the siblings. I think that would have worked for some of my brothers. Yeah. <laughs> I did want to mention some people asked for, you know, um, written versions of what we talked about here. So the blog post that Sam mentioned, or w lots of wonderful blog posts on her blog, which is Blitz Books. So search for Blitz Books and you'll find it. And my book is Practice Pie, and you can find that in all the usual book places, literally anywhere you buy books. It should be there. Let me know if it isn't. Thank you so much for doing this with me. Thank you, Nicola. This has been a blast. I hope it's been really helpful for people. And um, and go analogies, because um, the more we can make this stuff relatable, the easier it makes our job. So thank you, Nicola. It's always a delight chatting with you. Absolutely.